healthy communication. Mm -hmm. Why is that so hard? Because people don't understand their own emotionality. Yeah. You know, people think because they feel strongly about something, it's, it, it's indicative of how right they are, and it's not. It's just indicative of how they feel, and they don't know why they feel yeah. that way. If you're going to have a conversation or argument with someone, ask yourself, how do you feel? Because yeah. in, in, a, in a fight with anybody, the first battle is always with yourself. If you upset me, I can't think. Mm -hmm. I don't have access to facts. I don't have the time and attention to listen to what you're saying. I'm looking to defend my position. Yeah. But if I'm emotionally aware, I can talk to him about that. Don't convey your frustration, convey information. But most people can convey frustration. Don't convey your frustration, convey information. I aim to make emotional healing a global norm. Through cultivating candid discussions about love. My parents got married and divorced to each other three times. Or you can look at it as they kept trying. In the end of my father's life, that's what he told me. I aspire to mend marriages. I'm intentional about loving her mm -hmm. because um, now I understand that, you know, I was able to be free in loving me, then I can love her. Reignite hope for singles seeking future relationships. How can you glory in being single and want a companion at the same time? How can you not? I know. You're only going to be as, as successful as a wife as you were at a single. And inspire men to lead their homes in accordance with biblical principles. When I made my vows, I told God that I was going to take care of this gift. This is my gift. Oh, and I was obligated to see after him and him alone. Join me on this journey where these heartfelt and vulnerable conversations form the patchwork for the quilt that will envelop my future wife. I have uh, accepted their opinions without criticism. And uh, the theme is that I'm happy and I want to be happy in the future. I'm the Terrace R. Whitfield. Welcome to the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. Welcome to Dear Future Wifey Podcast. I'm your host, the Terrace R. Whitfield. Listen, are you still shacking up with us? If you're still shacking up with us, can we get a commitment? We're in season eight. Hit that subscription button and subscribe. Make sure you turn on your notification bell so you'll be notified about upcoming episodes. Also, visit the link in the description and make sure you sign up for our mailing list. We got amazing retreats coming up this year. And a lot of y'all are always like, how do I find out about it? Well, that's how you find out about it is by signing up for the mailing list. Let me tell y'all. Ah, so today's episode is going to be one of the most powerful episodes I've done to date. Y'all have been emailing me, DMing me, tagging this amazing queen and saying, you got to get her on the Dear Future Wifey podcast. Well, God did it. Oh, yeah, he did it. So without further ado, welcome to the Dear Future Wifey podcast. My new homie, Judge Lynn Toller. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Terrence. How are you? Let me tell you something. So as soon as I walked in, you asked me what? About the wig video. It's real. <laughs> I love that video. It's, for me, it's that in the Birdman video. Are we finishing all the way through? I said, you said my God. You was like, was that real? Was that real? I said, absolutely, it was real. It and tickled so, me. That was hilarious. Listen, when I DM'd you and asked you to be on the podcast and you responded within an hour, do you realize you made my year? I don't need to do nothing else. Oh, I knew it because I knew it was you. And that was the funniest <laughs> thing I had seen in a long time. And that young lady is fine, isn't oh, she? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh Whitney. Whitney yeah. is hilarious. She's Whitney... beautiful and she was hilarious. Man, let me tell you something. That's how you take an L. Oh, yeah. You, made, you know what I mean? Yeah, you I just took an L and made a W. You out just, of it. there you go. There it is. There you go. So, Lynn. Judge Lynn, because I said, I asked you, what do you want me to call? You was like, whatever you want to call me. But I, I got to call you Judge. I got to call you Judge. You spent years branding that name. Judge Lynn Toller. You're like everybody's auntie, everybody's mom. Everybody's that is my new title, auntie. Auntie? Auntie yeah. is my new title. Your new title. You, you just got thrusted into that title. Mm -hmm. huh? I did. I did. Why, I do, you did. Think, why do you think people gravitate uh, towards you like that? I think that I tell the truth, even when the truth does not benefit me. Mm. So you know it's the truth. 
because I talk too much to tell a lie. That's, <laughs> that, that, that's what my husband says. Don't become a criminal, baby. It's good you're on that side of the bench because you talk too much to make up stories because you won't remember what you say. And I'm honest about who I am and I don't try to portray an image that I'm not. Yeah. And I think no matter who I am, as long as I betray who I am, people appreciate that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yes. I'm not trying to be hot. I'm not trying to be sexy. I'm not trying to be <laughs> this. I'm not trying to be that. I'm just, this is who I am. Yeah. You know, this is what I know. Yeah. This is what I don't know. Mm -hmm. This is what I got wrong. This is what I got right. Have you always been like that? Always. Since my mother was like that. Oh, uh, really? My mother was like, my mother was like, you know, if I didn't love you, I'd let you go out looking like that. That's who she was. <laughs> love said, hurt at my house. She said, she said, if I didn't love, love you, I'd let you go out looking like that. like that. <laughs> Turn around and change. Can't have it. If I didn't love you, I would let you go out looking like that. She went, she said uh, to my girlfriend, oh, you went down to college down south and rose up like yeast because she got fat. <laughs> She said she rose up like yeast. Rose up like yeast in the heat of the Southern College. So you can't have a thin skin uh, being around your No, mama. no, no, no. It was, you know, you do what you do. You know, she was not gonna, the, the lie won't, a lie won't help. A lie will not help. Let me tell you something, uh, Judge Lynn. My audience knows one of my biggest fears is to, like, this is my whole journey as I discover, uncover, and recover love. Uh, after going through divorce about eight years ago, I said I want to be very intentional on the, the woman that I marry. I want to nurture that relationship. But one of my biggest fears, and I've always been transparent about it, is doing all this work to find the love of my life, not knowing the expiration date of their life. Right. And I said it would devastate me. It's like this underlying fear that I yeah. have. And you are the epitome of love gained and you have been very vulnerable and transparent about the loss of your amazing husband. Um, you were married April the 6th, 1989, right? Correct. And your husband passed away December the 23rd, 2022. Correct. I would like to title this episode, Love Lives On. There you go. It does. So you married Eric Mumford. How did, yeah. how, how did you meet this gentleman? I met Eric. I went to, I was, getting, I had another date with another dude, Seth. <laughs> but I had to go to this work thing. Yeah. So I said, look, I'm going to go to this work thing. We can hook up afterwards. So we go to this work thing. And it was a, it was a basketball game that Cleveland Cavaliers were playing. And we were in a loge. And there was a judge in the loge called Stephanie Tubbs Jones. And she looked at me. She didn't say hello. She didn't say hi. She didn't say, how you doing? She said, you got somebody? And I said, no, I don't. She said, I got somebody for you. And she took, she walked me out. Her husband was sitting with <laughs> Eric somebody. and another guy. And she said, Lynn, this is Eric. Eric, this is Lynn. And she goes, well, y'all get married. I want to do it. And she did. Two years later, we got married in her chambers. She said it. So she just knew that yeah, that was yeah. your husband. So when you guys get married, I want to do it. <gasps> I want to perform the ceremony. Wow. Yeah. So, so she just knew that. She just knew. Why? Where, where, where do you think that came from? I don't know. I mean, she, Eric was such a good dude, you know, and he had just gotten out of divorce with someone else. And mm -hmm. she's still alive, so I'm not going to say none about it. Right. She has four wonderful children, I will say that. Her, her sons, my stepson's great guys. Yes. Uh, but he had just gotten out of a, 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 mar a, 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 a marriage and he was bummed. I mean, he'd been married since he was 19. He was a, he, you know, he yeah, was a family you know. dude. And I, I don't know, she just saw me and thought, well, she's cute enough, let me give it a shot. And, uh, and I remember um, I wouldn't leave with him. I left with her. She said, I'll drive you home. And she drove me home. I called the guy that I had the date with and said, I'm sorry, I can't make it. I didn't tell him why. <laughs> and then uh, Stephanie and I drove home and we talked about her husband and my husband-to-be. She said, now this is how we do it. You know, it was just, she was just very convinced very so, early. So she just, it wasn't, it wasn't wishful thinking, it was a knowing. 
It was a knowing and I did not know her. I had met her that night. She drove me home. And I think she wanted to make sure I, you know, and the funny part was he didn't call me. The other dude called me that I didn't like as much. And uh, I was all bummed out because I thought they had agreed amongst themselves that he would chase me. And uh, you said agreed amongst, amongst themselves. themselves. They say, well, you know, well, you can have her. That's fine. And I was bummed out because I didn't like that other one. And then he called me three weeks later and I said, why did you take so long to call? And he finally said, he said, I knew if I went for you, it was serious. And I wasn't no, I didn't know if I was ready for serious. So I had to think about it. I love the honesty. Yeah. He said I had to think about it. I love the honesty. And so in that, when you look back, how old were you around that time? About 26, 27. Were you the type that was desiring marriage or were you career driven and was not? I was, I was desiring marriage at that time. I was already a lawyer. Yeah. So I was working in a law firm. I'd taken care of that part. And now I was like, huh, I really wanted to have kids. Yeah. And I wanted, I wanted a family. And so I wasn't intentional on looking because yeah. I'm just not that kind of person. Yeah. I'm not real social. It just happened to me. So. So when you, so you took what she said at face value, not knowing this woman. I liked him. After he introduced me, we talked and I really liked him. He was accountant. He was, re he was a regular dude. He wasn't trying to impress me. Yeah. He wasn't trying to be funny. He was just. You know, he was who he was, who he was. He was a regular dude. And I like most dudes, you know, they'll try to impress you and talk about their money or yeah. this. And he didn't. He, how like, important is that? Like, well, how important is it for people to show up authentically who they are and not try to be impressive? I'm going to be nice to you no matter how you show up with me. But if you're not authentic, you won't see me again. Because I ain't got time for it. You know what I mean? And, like and I'll that. deal with you, whatever, whatever, whatever. Yeah. But I ain't got time for all of that. And yeah. I ain't got time. You know, it's not my job to like you or not like yeah. you. I've got to deal with you or not deal with you. But if you're not authentic, you know, I, I take you for who you are. Yeah. D because I don't have time. So in the dating process, y'all got married two years later. Two years, yeah. Was it anything like in that two years where you feeling like he was taking too long? Or were you patient no, enough? No, we were, no, we were, you, we, you know, he had a plan and I had a plan. What was his plan and what was yours? My plan was him, his plan was me. <laughs> and, you know, he wanted somebody young with no kids, yeah. no debt, no concerns. That was me. And I wanted a dude that was solid. I can't have no wishy-washy cat. Mm. I got to have a man's man. I can't have none of that. My father was a man's man and Eric was a man's man. He, you know, I used to couldn't talk about him on podcasts and what? stuff. He didn't like it. He says, I don't want all that yapping about me. I ain't doing that because he's dead. But you know what I mean? He didn't like it. So if you go on my Instagram, you don't see many pictures of him before this past year. Oh, he didn't year. want you posting them at all. No. Nope. Not just talking about him. No. Nope. He didn't want you posting them. No. Nope. And it would have been of value to me to post it yeah. because I was about relationships. Yeah. But I respected his privacy more than I needed the, you know, the additional views. So I respected him on that. And I just didn't, I don't, I didn't. Yeah. One thing that, um, that drew me to you is your capacity to be vulnerable in moments where people would not want to show their vulnerability, especially by you being a staple in our community, being the face that we see coming to our homes on our television sets for over 14 years. And then for you to go through this heartbreaking moment and then you're showing that experience, you're showing that journey uh, out loud. Why? Why did you take that hard posture? In the moment, I don't think I had a choice. I was so stunned and so broken. I was working it out myself. And as you do in life, you tend not to stick to something difficult if you don't have to. But if I was doing it on IG, I was telling a story 
So it was some place to go every morning where I could work through the feelings. And it was, it was like journaling. Yeah. You know, and since I had a place to go and I read the comments after I post and they were encouraging yeah. and it was a conversation that I had begun between me and my people. And it was a good conversation. And I would find that I would start a post feeling one way and finish it feeling another. Mm. And that's the job of, of writing for me is to manage your emotions. And I was managing them in real time for real effect because I really needed to get better. You know, so that's how that happened. And it just became a habit. And it was, you know, even on the, on struggling days, yeah. I could go back and read them. Yeah. One by one, because I, so I could see, because it was like, I remember my, I had a girlfriend, I called her my grief coach, her name was Henrietta. And, uh, and I would feel better for a second, and then I'd feel bad again, and I would call her crying, talking about, I, I can't get, I can't. She says, think roller coaster, not mountain. You thinking you're climbing and getting better. That's not what it is. It's roller coaster. So once you accept that it's roller coaster, you don't have to, you don't have to dread the lows as much. Yes. You have to think your way through how you feel. And you have to adopt ideas and feelings and things from other people. And you can't do that. You can. I cannot do that. Uh, clearly, unless I write it down. Yeah. So I took all of the things I needed, all of the love that I was getting from the people that I knew, all of the love that I was getting from the people that I didn't know. Yeah. And I, and I walked that. I walked that. So writing is cathartic for you. Very much so. Very much so. Has that always been your, your, your escape as a kid? Yeah. Did you journal a lot? My first book, my, I write all the time. You know, yeah. I've got a whole lot of books in my, my computer. And my first book, My Mother's Rules, I wrote in 2007 because my mother was an emotional beast. I mean, she was the most emotionally intelligent person I have ever met in my life. And I thought all of the best moments I had on the on my bench, you know, when I was would sending people to jail and dealing with people who had killed somebody or 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 uh, got into a fight or beaten their wife, my most extraordinary moments on there were things where I repeated something my mother said to me. I love it. And she was so extraordinary that I decided that everybody could benefit from the way she thinks the through how she feels because that's how I survive. And she taught me how to do it because I'm a very shy, retiring person who never could have done this had I not had a mother who made me look at myself. Mm. And I never, I don't mind, I can list all my faults and weaknesses and it don't bother me because it's just something else to fix. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I love to fix stuff. So. But was this one of those things that we learned, you know, hindsight being 2020, when you were young, getting those gems, those nuggets deposited into you, you didn't realize the I gravity knew. of it? You knew it I didn't. knew. You did? My mother was a bad chick. I remember we were sitting in a, because we talked like that. So let me tell you, you see that over there, Lynn? Let me tell you. Let me tell you, I remember one day she said to me, we walked, she was talking to this lady and, uh, I said, Who, what, what's her name? She didn't introduce me, which was odd. And I said, Mom, why didn't you introduce me? She goes, I forgot her name. <laughs> and I said, I said, you forgot her name? And I said, well, you don't know her very well? She said, I've known her for 40 years. And I said, well, I just forget her name. And she says, I don't like her. And I, and I don't make room in my head for people I don't like. So she didn't have access to her name. Now, if you have the ability not to remember people you don't like, do you know how much better her life is because she runs her emotions and her emotions don't run her? You said she knows for 40 years. She says, I just, I, you know, I don't make room for people I don't like.
That's powerful. <laughs> That's powerful and hilarious at the same time. time. Yeah, no, Mama was funny. Mommy was very funny. He said, Mommy, you don't know her name. I won't that make room for people that I don't, I don't like. Mm -mm. So how did she love you? Like, like from the heart posture of like being raised with that level of, of teaching, that level of wisdom, that level of truth. And you said that you would go back to those moments while you're judging people mm -hmm. in their worst state. They're right. coming to you. Did you know, like, did you know those moments were coming? Have you been doing that? Like when you date guys, would you be dropping these gems on them as you've been going along? Not at all. <laughs> I, you know, because I went to an all-girls school okay. and I didn't date a lot. And I, I started dating at Harvard. You know what I mean? Really? And, 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 and Harvard was the blackest experience I had had to that point. <laughs> Which Harvard. says something to Harvard. you about my uh, it was said to you about my upbringing. We lived on three streets, and a bunch of uh, black men had bought land together, and uh, they distributed amounts amongst themselves on the outskirts of Columbus, Ohio, so they could live out there because they weren't allowed to live in nice neighborhoods mm. inside Columbus. This was in the '40s, so it was a whole black a whole neighborhood of black professionals, but there was just maybe 15 families. So we ended up going to white schools. Yeah. And so the blackest school I went to was, that's where I ran into all the brothers. And brothers date aggressively. What you mean by that? I gonna say date aggressively. Well, I, I thought they were aggressive. <laughs> what was they doing? <laughs> Just Lynn? You should be with me, but what you go, what's that got to do with me? I don't, I don't, I don't you know, it was just like, I was like, oh, oh my, do I have to have a reason not to want to go? I didn't know. That's why you welcomed that's why you welcomed Eric, because you said he was just, just cool. Don't, yeah, don't be bothering me. Just sit there and be you and let me like you, but don't come for me. But no, no I thought women like for guys to be intentional and, and, and pursuit. So you don't, you don't like that level of pursuit? I don't like pushing. You know, yeah. keep coming, coming. If I say no, and I'm smiling at you. I'm just being nice. It doesn't mean I'm looking to be convinced. I said what I meant. So I don't know about all that. I like, I mean, I'm not going to call you. But you ain't never had a guy change your mind? Like by him being, uh, by him being <laughs> at first you started off not liking him. And then you, he was in friend zone and he began to be so cool with Once you. Once you annoy me, that's where you stay. Unless you do something really terrific to get out of that. Because once you annoy me, I separate myself. You know what I mean? I, I don't have to, you know, I don't have to tell from it. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a loner. I can be by myself. So I didn't need yeah. a man. Yeah. Wanted a family. He said, I didn't need a man, but I wanted a family. So I got me a good one. I didn't need a man, but I wanted a family. Yeah. So you got you a good one. So I got me a good one. So at what point did you see him as your husband? I'm rephrase that. At what point did you see Mr. Eric Mumford as your husband? It was a Friday evening. And uh, he said he would be there. I don't know if it was Friday. He said he'd be there at five to pick me up at work or something. I'm making up the time. Yeah, yeah. Five, ten, he wasn't there, I went home. So I'm home, and this is when you don't have cell phones, yeah. this is back in the 80s. Yep. I get a phone call. What are you doing? Where are you? And I said, I'm home. I said, where are you? He says, I'm outside your building in the rain, trying to get in. And I said, well, you were 10 minutes late. So I went home. 10 minutes. And the next time we went out, he was on time. And I said, well, there you go. And you, you felt like that was your husband at that moment? He changed. I liked him all along. I liked what he was doing. I liked what he was saying. But that told me he was willing to change to accommodate me. Who we got to let that sit right there. He was willing to do something different for me. And that's so. And that's important. It's yeah. very important. It's you know, 
Because a lot of dudes you date, it's me, it's me, it's me, it's me. This is who I am. This is who I am. This is my program. This is how I'm running. Ooh, I like you. You could be good for me. Ah, I could get you this. I could buy you this. Daddy already bought it. Already had it. You know what I mean? So I don't, so all of that stuff, it didn't do anything for me. So what do you say about that? Because I know that, you know, the type of guys you were meeting around that time, I would assume were guys that were successful and mm-hmm. whatnot. So are you not swayed by finances when you hear this stuff in these social media streets? I know you hear it about the guy providing 100% and the soft life and all that. What is your take on that soft life of man providing 100%? And- if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. I am not interested in that. I, I, I provide for myself. I made my own money. I, I, you know what I mean? I've got a doctorate in law and I'm fine. Yeah. And um, I did. The reason you know who I am was because of Eric. Talk about that. I would still be a lawyer in Cleveland absent him. What, a, what, what we managed to do. And I don't think everybody can manage to do it. Everybody has to do their own game plan. But what we managed to do was to take what I was good at and to take what he was good at and combine them and become this better thing. I was a lawyer who hated practicing law. I had the opportunity to run for judge. I was 33 years old. I was black in a mostly white district. I I didn't know anybody in my neighborhood. I had no business winning that race, but my husband did not know how to lose. And he made me, we almost got a divorce. I want you to do five more houses tonight. You need to do 10 more houses. You need to get out there. You need to get out there. We were fighting and arguing and every day, more, more, more. I won by six votes. Are you serious? Six votes. So every night he made me go out and do 10 more houses. I owe him. Every night, I owe him. And then when TV called, I didn't want to do it because I'm risk adverse. I had just won re-election by 80% of the vote. I didn't want to. I didn't want to leave that guaranteed gig. Mm-hmm. And they only guaranteed me 13 weeks of work. And I looked at Eric. I said, I can't do it. He says, What if you can get a contract that guarantees your? Pay? I said, I can't do that. He says, Let me get. I'm gonna talk to my lawyer. We'll get, and he says, if you can get, it, it was something I wouldn't have asked for God. because it was arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> but you said, Eric, don't believe in losing. Mm-mm. And he said, you ask for that. And I did. And they gave it to me. Job lasted four months. I was home for five years getting paid a judicial salary because I listened to that man. Oh, God. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. He couldn't have done it without me. I couldn't have done it without him. Yes. This is who we were. So it wasn't about, we were both 100 per 100. Yes. Absent either one of our talents, none of this happened. That's what people need to understand right there. None of this happened. So there's no, there's no formula. We just figured it out as we went along, but it was always, I'll take the best that I got and I'll get up under your stuff and do that for you. And I'll take, you take the best that you got and get up under my stuff, and I'll do the best for you. What did you do? With, so during that time, he was still an accountant? Mm-hmm. So what were you doing to help him in his, in his vision? Oh, listen, uh, you know, when he would hire new, he had lost somebody, I would go in his office, I was running the interviews, I was his receptionist, <laughs> yeah. yeah, he'll see you now, I'll do you that. I, was, I set up all his, his computers and his phones. I'm on all of his, you know, yeah. I set up all of it because I'm better at that than he was. And a, a little younger, he was about 10 years older than me. Yeah. And I can barely do it. And he, so he couldn't do it at all, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just like three years ago, he saw the little uh, musical note on the phone and said, what's that about? His iTunes, he didn't know what it was. <laughs> Because that's not what he does. Yeah, yeah. But I'm a very practical person. Yeah. So contracts, I do his contract. You know, yeah. anything he needed, he did real estate. I'd read the contracts. Yeah. I'd do this. We did everything. We didn't do everything together. 
but whatever we were doing, the other person could assist. Yes. And to the extent that we could assist, we did. Because it was all about, it was, it was the country Mumford Toller versus the rest of y'all. And sometimes the rest of y'all included the children. I still love you. <laughs> uh, but it was us. And then it was the world. Yes. And you had to beat us both. Did y'all work into that in a marriage? Like, how did it start off? Like, did it start off because you were still young during that time, about 28 when you got married, right? Yeah, I mean, he was 36 and he had been married before. Right. So he was an adult. Yeah. You know, so he knew what he was doing. We went to marriage counseling before we got married Good. for six months. Good. And every one of the problems he said we were going to add, we had. <laughs> but we were ready. Yes. And we were miserable for a number of years there. But it said for better or for worse. So that's what we did. You know, no hitting, no cheating, none of that. Yeah. But no getting along too for a while. But how did you weather that? How did, what made you say, regardless of what we're going through, I'm not leaving? One, we had kids and I, did, I, I didn't want to end that thing. And then um, I called my mother because I was complaining about it, complaining and complaining. And she said, you know, yo, yo, I'm going to tell you what to do, but you got to do it. You can't keep calling and complaining. You can't stay mad and stay married. Either you do what I tell you to do or quit calling me. I don't, you know, one you of the two. You can't stay mad and stay, stay married. married. He says, you have to decide that you're going to change. I said, yeah, but he was wrong. And he says, yeah, but he's fine. He's not calling me, you are. So if you want the situation to change, you need to change and he will have to follow suit. That's what mom said. That's what mom said. And you listened. I listened. And so I would call her every few days. This is what happened, now what? <laughs> and she talked me through it. When you started changing your heart posture, did you watch, like Mama said, did he start changing? Mm -hmm. Really? Oh, she, I mean, it was like she wrote a book and I was just reading it. This chick was bad. She really, really was. Everything she said happened just the way she said Did you grow up watching, like, was your, was your parents married? <laughs> my parents, you know, my mom buried my dad. They were married 30 they were married more longer than me and Eric. 36 years, and I think Eric and I only made 34. 33. 33, yeah. yeah. 33. They were married longer than we were. Uh, and she buried him. And um, he was uh, bipolar, unmedicated, oh. uh, you know, just a wild man. And all of her job was keeping him stable. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, like one time, all of the shades weren't down equidistantly around the house. So daddy called mommy all day long, every 10 minutes all day for 12 hours. To, to, to adjust it? No, to complain about how she had allowed his reputation to diminish because she didn't put the shades all the way down. So after a while, I said, mommy, why do you keep answering the phone if you know he's just calling to yell at you? See, this is back in the 60s. Yeah. She says, if he's calling me, that means he's not on his way home. And that means he's going to stay at the office. And I don't want him home when he's mad. So I take the phone call, I take the abuse, and I, I go on with my day. That's who she was. And, it, and she didn't let it upset her. Most people would be flustered yeah. by it. She didn't let it upset her. This man is not thinking right. I need to do this. This is how I'm going to manage it. And that's what she, that's who she was. That's who she was. Man, I need to see, I need to read this My Mother's Rules. Oh, so she you're was, talking about that's in that book. That's Stuff in like that book. Everything she taught me about how to manage myself and my life, she managed my father. I mean, he was mercurial. He would burn down houses. He had what? Was shot at a gun. It was, I mean, it was, it was, I, I had two nervous breakdowns, one at nine, one at 16. She managed all of that, sent one 
got him to work every day, sent one woman, one daughter to Dartmouth, another to Harvard. Wow. One is a judge, and my sister is a board certified neurologist. She did that. She did that. And it's funny, when they were older and you know, my, my sister and I were around, people would ask, Mom, how did your kids you know, do yeah. so well? And she said, I married well, because he was very financially very secure. We didn't pay for any, he paid for all of our college, medical school, law school. What was he school. doing? Lawyer. So he was a lawyer that dealt with bipolar disorder? <laughs> Unmedicated his whole life. But was a beast in the courtroom. Brilliant. Brilliant. You would, I went home, I went home one time, 15, uh, 15 um, years after he had died, and I was going to a, a continuing legal education, and I just said, hey, my name's, they go around the room and say, who are yeah. you? I'm Lynn Toller, I'm a retired judge, but I'm keeping my license. And a white dude down the, down the line said, he goes, my name is Brian so-and-so. Uh, I don't know if you're any relationship to Bill Toller. And I said, yeah, I'm his daughter. He said, that is the most respected intelligent. I mean, he just went on and on, man, I have ever met in the practice of law. Wow. How did that make you feel? Oh. And to know that he was unmedicated, but diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. He got put out of the army behind it because he had beat up a officer who wouldn't let him in the officer's club because he was black because it was 40s, it was in the 40s, and he was a, uh, he was a lieutenant who used to clean, do, uh, go into the, uh, the uh, trenches. Oh, yeah, yeah. And flame fro, burn out the, uh, the Japanese from the, the trenches in the Solomon Islands. That's what he did in That's the what he war. Did. He went into the tunnels, because it was the black troops yep. were, were, would do mop up afterwards. And so they just went into the tunnels with flamethrowers. That's what they were doing. Wow. Yeah. And so, guys, you come from some oh yeah, it was minds. oh yeah. yeah yeah he was he intellectually, you know, he was a beast. And he had like IQ 144, and he was the dumbest one of his brothers. <laughs> and my sis, my mother was emotionally intelligent. I mean, she had a genius level emotional IQ. I thought. So. Well, listen to what the what she said and how she navigates. Oh yeah! Experience. Oh man! And what was her occupation? Mom. Really? Mm-hmm. She stayed home. He, that's why he married her. He said, "Look, I can't have a wife that works. I need someone who cook and clean. Get me up." I, he couldn't do anything. He couldn't do anything but practice law. He was a great guy too. Funny, loyal, loving, caring. It wasn't his decision to be crazy. Yeah. He just was. Yeah. But he was a good dude. He really was a good dude. You can't, and I, and I always I want to say this because I told those stories. Every time I tell those stories, people say you were in an abusive relationship, and she was. It was a difficult relationship. Uh, but I say we, we were not a dysfunctional family. We functioned well. Everybody got where they were going. And nobody was mad when it was over. Mm. The last five years of life after he had strokes and he was home, all of the strokes hit him in parts of his brain that chilled him out. Really? Yeah. He had about four or five of them. And he made him silly. I remember the first time he ever put his arm around me. We were in the, uh, we were in the hospital room. He says, you know, everything's upside down, right? Because his vision got inverted but they were chilling for five years they they popped him in the brain made him cool made him calm and they were chilling the reason why that's so impactful for a couple of reasons a the son that i adopted struggles with bipolar disorder Ooh. and um his mom bipolar uh schizophrenic and i told my son that you can tap into your brilliance. Even though you have this level of diagnosis, you don't have to be that, so to speak. And so to hear you speak the way you speak about your father, having a brilliant mind and having 
unmedicated. <laughs> He's not, he has no medication to thwart this uh, mental illness. Right. But he's spoken of so highly by his peers. It's so encouraging. The second thing is the vows that we take yeah. through sickness and in health. And oftentimes when we talk about through sickness and in health, we're talking about somebody that may get diagnosed from cancer or, or, or something like that. But we don't talk about mental, mental illness, illness as a sickness. And for your mom to have the wherewithal to say, this is my husband. He right. didn't, he didn't right. ask to, to, to have this diagnosis. This is who he is. This is who I said my vows to. And we're going to do this thing until death do we part. Yeah. And, and she told me when she said he wasn't a bad man with a good game. He was a good man with a bad diagnosis. And so when you're a good man with a bad diagnosis, you can work with it. If you're a bad man with good game, you know, you'll get stuck. Yeah. But but it doesn't get any better. Yes. And so she understood it for what it was and she didn't take it personally. And he loved her so tremendously and he loved his children so tremendously that uh, we were a loving, engaged, you know, a lot of lights and sirens. But we were one hell of a family. You said a lot of lights and sirens. A lot of lights and Who sirens. Who was showing up at your house all the time? No, because mom did not call the police. <laughs> we weren't allowed. But what we would do is when we'd have a, he'd have a bad moment, we all knew to jump out of the windows, gather around the back of the garage. Mom kept an extra purse and blankets in the back of her car. This is back in the day. We'd go to the drive-in movies mm -hmm. till 2 a.m. Then we would come home, and I, she'd put me up on her shoulders because I was little, and I would look in the window, and if he was in bed, we could go in. If not, we'd have to find someplace else to go. So, why did I tell you that story? I don't know, but I'm, I'm oh, doing it. Oh, Ava. Because the reality is this. When you talk about people say when you start sharing about your upbringing, they call it abuse. Oh, yes. And it was difficult, no doubt. Of course. And wasn't nobody happy about it. Right. But, but you said we made it work. And you said at the very end, nobody was mad. When everybody would, we would sit at the table and fall out laughing. Really? Remember that time, Daddy? You sat over there. Remember that time, Daddy? The, the guy at the, at, at the dealership called you by your first name and introduced you to him, said his boss's bill, and you jumped over and strangled him? You remember that? <laughs> remember that time, Daddy? You chased Mom? <laughs> we were, this is, we, that's what happened. It's what happened, and we all loved each other. He snapped because somebody introduced him as his first name. <laughs> went, went over the desk at him. So he wants to be called Mr.? Well, he was buying a car, and it was in the 70s. And the, the, deal, he, the dealer guy was trying to make him feel small, say, to introduce, Bill, this is my boss, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Uh -oh. Johnson, this is Bill. He wasn't going to have that. He was born in 1919. You know what I mean? He was a black man. He was five foot two inches tall. He wasn't going to go for it. He jumped over and choked him. We had to pull him out. Oh, we pulled him out of a lot of places. I remember one time he did a suit. We had to put. Mom and I wouldn't go back. Kathy went with him. We said, you know, you, you, know, you, you go back with him. We're not doing it. Oh, yeah. So when he remembered that, when y'all were recalling that in his old age, he remembered that? And we would all laugh. We would all. It was funny by then. It was funny. And you know, mom made a, a conscious effort and she, we talked about it too. I made sure you never disliked him. Even oh. though he started trouble, I made sure you never disliked him. I was wise enough and old enough to know he was a good man. You were too young to understand that what he did was not a function of his, his lack of value. What he did was a function was of, of lack of sanity. And so she made sure we didn't dislike him until we were old enough to understand that what he did was a function not of not being a good person, but not of being able to, you know, maintain his emotional health. You know what I mean? Good. Oh, that's so good. Because she covered y'all's perspective mm -hmm. of your father. Right. That's what a wife is. Right, yeah. That's, that's what a husband is supposed to be, is the covering. And not only are they covering each other, but she covered your perception of Repent. your father. For our sakes and his. Yeah. Because we love him and yeah. we enjoy him. And we, 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 we had uh, years with him that were just wonderful. And she gave us that gift 
by that allowing us to be angry with him. You see what I'm saying? People aren't going to understand it. I, th I think they're going to say a lot of bad things about him, and I hate that. But he was a brilliant man. He was difficult, but he loved his people. He think about how, how can you how can you beat somebody down that's dealing with a mental illness? Right. Like, it's like if they this had... man was a black born in 1919. He deserved a few. <laughs> <laughs> He'd have been through some things. He'd have been through some things. I just, he used to work when he went to college. He became an attorney. He went to college. He would work. His father had had a lot of strokes, so he couldn't get out of the bed. Mm. So dad would work two, works in a, two weeks in the coal mine. Hold on. Two that, weeks in college. That, hold on. You just touched on something. That's exactly what your father had. What? A bunch of strokes. Yeah. Like his, like mm, his father. Yeah. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Down the middle of the brain. His father had a bunch of mini strokes. My sister had a stroke. So I'm, I'm careful about my cholesterol and my triglycerides and my attention to all of it. But he would go to school for two weeks, then he'd work in the coal mines for two weeks so he could feed the family. College two weeks, coal mine two weeks, until he went to law school. Hard worker. I mean, he took me into the mouth of that coal mine. I said, I can't go in. What did it, it look like? It was just dark. It was just black. I, I don't know how he could do it. He says, you know, if you in and it, and it comes down, it's some men can never go back in. It's just, it, it's, it was scary. It was really scary. So you grew up seeing hard work, knowing hard work, right. being cultivating hard work. Right. And you're, so how did, how was that positioning? Because you watched your mom be a stay at home mom, but then you entered into the workforce. And like, what was that? Did your mom always encourage you that? Was your mom depositing, hey, become a wife and be a mother? What was the upbringing and teaching like? My parents were, pick your Ivy League college and then you can decide which kind of doctor you want to be. Other than that, we don't want to hear from you. Pick your Ivy League college. college and you can tell us what kind of doctor you would like to be, but you will be physicians. And I remember the phone call. I went to college, didn't go to class at all. <laughs> and so I didn't have the requirements to get into med school. And I called home, I said, well, Dad, I can't get into med school. He said, well, he said, you better go to some graduate school because if you stop going to school, you got to go to work. <laughs> and so I wasn't ready to go to work. So I went to law school and uh, I took the LSAT, got into law school, and um, I, will, I was a lawyer by default. Why say by default? Because he wanted to be, me to be a doctor, and I couldn't get into medical school because I, go I didn't go to class. But what kind of grades, when you actually showed up in class, what kind of student were you? I didn't show up. Well, I'm talking about when you went to college. I mean, when you... <laughs> I didn't go. I, I went to... Law school? Yes. I didn't know easiest... I would go to the first class, and in the first class, they give you the syllabus. And I go by the books, and I would follow the syllabus at home. And in the last class of the year, they always went over what was going to be on the exam. <laughs> so I would go to that class. No, you wouldn't. And then I would take the exam. Judge Lynn, you did not do that. I did. You went to the first and last class? Too. I did. <laughs> <laughs> and then after my last exam, I put all my stuffs in bags. I didn't, I didn't walk. I didn't do anything. I went into the registrar's office. I said, this is my parents' address. Please send my <laughs> diploma to them. I'm out. Why would you like that? I didn't like it. I didn't like law school. I thought it was awful. <laughs> what were you doing all that time? What were you, do what were you doing during the hours? <laughs> I don't know. I was watching soap operas. All my children. As the world As turns. The world turns. God, 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 God flies in tonight. General Hospital, <laughs> bold and beautiful. I knew what everybody was doing. And you passed. <laughs> you messed around and graduated. Messed around and graduated. By default. By default. <laughs> so that you was your dad proud? Even though you were the doctor, was he proud that I'd you became an attorney following his footsteps? He, no. He was mad about it because he thought it was going to be too hard. But I tell you what I did. I ran for judge. He was dying when I ran for judge. Mm. I did two things. I, I got married to a man he didn't like. He didn't like Eric. Why not? 
He had four kids and just got oh, yeah. a divorce. And my mother didn't like him either. <laughs> Both of them. No, they didn't. Never met me. Just like, you're a lawyer. You're single. You have no debt. You have an investment fund. You know, an yeah. investment fund since you were twelve. Why are you marrying a guy with four kids in debt? That's what you know. Yeah. But once I married them, they were very supportive because they were like, the destination has always been happy. We would we didn't pick this ship, but since it's the ship you're on, we're going to help paddle it. There it is. So, so that's where they were on that. I don't forgot what I was talking about. You again. was talking about the fact that when you was running for judge and and you said, oh, daddy, the, oh yeah, the, 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 the daddy was dying, and as he was dying, and I got pregnant, and I said, daddy, you can't die because I'm going to have a baby, <laughs> and he says, well, Lenny, when are you due? And I said, well, mommy, it's, it's, dad, it's going to be June. He said, I said, can you wait till June? He said, all right. So I have the baby. And then after I had the baby, yeah, right now, all I remember, I was sitting at my desk in my office, I'll never forget it. And I had the baby, and then I ran for judge. The baby was like eight months old. And I said, Daddy, I'm running for judge. Just, just, just hang on for a little while longer. And um, when uh, they put my robe on me, he had he he only had like 20 percent heart function left. So we had to drive up onto the sidewalk so we could get him in there. I had never seen him cry before. And I was given a speech and it was packed. And my husband was crying over here and he was crying over there. And I was like, uh huh. That's that. There you go, Daddy. Yeah. He died six months later. Mm. I was like, "There you go, pops." I gave you that. I gave you that. And I, I felt. I did. You know what I mean? You feel like he held on. I, oh, I, 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 yeah, I do. Held my mother, my it. mother believes that too. Yeah. He held. He had a reason to live. Yeah. He had a reason to live. What do you think that meant to him? You talking about a black man? Uh, born in 1919, watching his black daughter become a judge. While his black uh, neurology, board certified neurologist daughter is sitting next to him. That was our, that was our, that was our return gift for all the gifts that he gave us. And I want to say the gift of a difficult upbringing. I'm so sorry. Uh, you can determine. You can you can call it trauma, or you could call it a trial. I call it a trial. It wasn't easy, but I'm stronger. I am not traumatized. I'm not. It's amazing because now it's all making sense for you to be able to for you to be thrusted into the position of watching your father. Uh, pretty much take his last breath. Do you think that prepared you? I know it's extremely difficult to be prepared to lose the love of your life, but do you think God and all his omniscience gave you that experience so you could be a little prepared when you had to experience that on your own? I don't think so. I, I think when dad died, I was in, my, my sister was like, in Europe, and I was in the Caribbean, and mom was here all by so like, where are you, niggas? She died, and you just, you, you ain't nobody in the country. <laughs> but when my mother died, Ooh. it was here, and uh, she had... Uh, here as in here? As in Design. here. And uh, she had uh, frontal temporal lobe dementia like uh, Bruce Willis, mm. but at the end, hers mimicked ALS, Lou mm. Gehrig's disease, so she just started losing muscle function. And um, every day, you know, she could do less and less and less and less and less. That was a difficult death, but I had a chance to come to grips with it. I didn't have a chance to come to grip with him. He died like that. Even though you kept telling him to hold on six more months, hold on. Oh, and I'm talking about Eric now. I'm oh, sorry. Talking Eric. I'm talking oh, about yeah. Eric now. Oh, Eric okay. died like that. Dad held on and held on, and then he, you know, yeah. died when I was out of the country. But yeah, now I don't think it was. I mean, everybody dies. Yeah. You don't get to skip it. 
my mother used to say, you beat the game if everybody dies in the right order. <laughs> so, because I was upset. I was upset. Because yeah. I was upset. I was crying. She said, Lynn, you're burying me. I'm not burying you. We beat the game. Because that's the best you can do. That's what mama said. Mm -hmm. You're burying me. I'm not burying you. I beat the game. That's who she was. Oh, she was a bad chick. I remember I was one time we were sitting there and I was touching her and crying and she was looking at me and she said, let's not go falling in love at this late date. Mom wanted me to stop. We were mooning over her death and she goes, let's not start falling in love at this late date. Let's just keep moving. And I said, okay. Then I left. Oh, she was extraordinary. I know this was supposed to be about Eric, wasn't it? It was supposed to be about you. Oh. I just, because in order to know you, you have to know who deposited all, all, those, that. Yeah, all those gems in you. Because the person that people love so much was built, the foundation, the shoulders in which you stand, is that dad. Yeah. That was quote unquote bipolar. My, yeah, mommy and daddy, yeah. they were the same thing. She had a whole bunch of this, he had a whole bunch of that, and they got it together and they got where they were going. And Eric and I are the same way. He had a whole bunch of this, I had a whole bunch of that. And we got it together and we got where we were going. That's the reason why I always say people need to keep their mouth off of other people's relationship because you don't know what makes it work. Don't have a clue, don't have a clue. Somebody can sit there and look at you. Well, how can you be with this man that, that's bipolar? He, you run into the movie theater in the middle of the night. And how could you be your kids going through all this and don't realize that experience is producing a Judge Lynn Tolan? Right. Yeah. It, you know, if your life is always happy, you're not going to do well. At all. You know what I mean? You have to struggle a little bit yeah. because you don't get to know each other. You don't get to know yourself. You, go, you don't get to grow. You don't get to progress. And part of that is the struggle. And... You know, it's so funny. We complain about our partners, but rarely do we call when, ah, you know what? You know, he gave me a foot rub tonight. It was nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I'll call tomorrow and say, you know, yeah. You know, you just, yeah. you, you, so it's just, I don't, that's why, I mean, I don't know. I think that's why a lot of people are in trouble these days because there's too much commentary and too little, you know. We had borders around our thing. Mm. We had a moat, mm. you know, we had, <laughs> we had machine around. gun turrets. <laughs> we wouldn't let nobody get in here. And y'all protected that for 33 years. I mean, mightily. And it's hard to do when, when you do what I do, yeah. I, what, what I do. But, you know, I, every once in a while I would do, I, hey, baby, can I get a picture? And he, yeah, okay. Baby, can I get a picture of you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you want that? Or, and uh, always on my birthday, he'd get me a, give me a picture. <laughs> but uh, thirty-three was, years. Yeah, thirty-three years. Jocelyn, how are you doing right now? How's your heart? I have my good days and my bad days. Um, I'm really good this week because my sister-in-law, his sister, is here. And are y'all really close? We weren't until he died. Really. And we got so close. And um, we've been here together, I think, celebrating him. I thought we were going to initially just grieve because she's helping me. You saw his clothes are out there. Yeah. I've had him out there for a year. I can't do anything with him. And she said, well, let me fly out there and see if I can help you. And um, it's kind of been like a celebration of life because he's, she and I weren't close, so she would tell me a lot about when he was young yeah. that I didn't know about. And then um, I told him a, her a lot about the stuff that was happening with us that she didn't know about. Yeah. So I'm getting to uh, relive pieces and parts of the best of it. So it's been a good week. Good. It's been a good week. Good, good. With uh, 
being frozen with his clothes, what does that mean to you to remove his clothes from your home? What is that doing to you? I keep saying I don't know what to do with them, but I just don't think I want to let them go. No, I know. That so I keep asking her, what do you think we should do? And she keeps telling me, but then I keep asking her. Hmm. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think I'm just, I'm just, I'm. Do you feel like letting go of it is letting go of him? A little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Don't want to lose him. Yeah. Completely, you know, a uh, little bit. You created these volumes of books. There's mm -hmm. three volumes that lay on this table. And I said, I wanted this to be on this table because I just want to celebrate this king. Um, what made you decide to do these books? Well, my family doesn't believe in funerals. They don't? Mm -mm. I didn't have one for my mom or my dad. And uh, so Eric and I decided, you know, we were going to cremate and keep it moving. And uh, I wanted to do something. And I thought uh, a uh, internet thing was too ephemeral. And I just wanted uh, This book is absolutely beautiful. I can't believe he's, he has all these pictures. Like, when do you have all these pictures? Like, well, he was 71, you know? Yeah, but I'm talking about most, I don't even have pictures of me in my childhood. Yeah, no, like, you, you know what this? I did? I, his sister, his sister had them. Since she, cause she had all of his, his parent, their parents uh, stuff. So she sent me all that. And you did three books. Mm -hmm. So what did you, did you start off just saying, I'm going to do one or did you already know you were I started do one? off, I was going to do one. And I thought I was going to do one with three chapters. And then I realized I had too much stuff. So I just did three books. What does this mean to you? What does, when you've given this to family members, what have they said? One of them complained. About what? Let's not get into that. Not uh, much, really. Tell you the truth. You know how, how much did I would. This would be like awesome to me because I did. I did this for Valentine's Day when I was married. I did. It's called the story of the two hearts, and I did a, a photo album or a book that I wrote, and it had my my ex wife and my daughter, even though that wasn't her biological uh -huh. mom, but I did this beautiful book. So this right here, it hits, it hits. Yeah, yeah. So this stuff right here is like highly valuable to me. And so um, you tell me people just got it and just didn't say much about it. Like, okay, no. thank you. My, my sister-in-law did, she, she says, when I stop crying, I'll call you. So, yeah. you know, but I, other than that, mm -hmm. not really. I never thought you about did. that until you just said that. And you done did three books and sitting out there by <laughs> Was there a theme in these volumes? Well, I was going to do early life, middle yeah. life, later life, and then, you know, that's all. So I, it was just pretty much chronological. It was just chronological. Was this therapeutic for you? No, it was. It was? It was awful. And after a while, I just had to hand it off to the boys because I couldn't. It was too much. It was just, just so what too made many memories. He deserved it. Because he didn't have a funeral. I just wanted something permanent of him. You know what I mean? Funerals are, they're fleeting as well. Yeah. You're there and then they're gone. You spend a lot of money and you got nothing. I got that. Do you believe in funerals? Mm -mm. Your whole them. family just don't believe in we you. We don't believe. Raised that way. Yeah, we don't believe in them. Do people get mad at you because of that? I don't know, don't get. <laughs> at all. Like your mama. Mm -mm. Yeah. You your mama's daughter. I am. I am Tony's baby girl. This is so true. The book of Tony. So where, where did this book come from? What made you do this one? Well, I had, my mother was getting older and I always wanted to do a good, I love giving good Christmas presents. So I would do, I did a Christmas present that was a retrospective of her life. One, one with her grandsons in it one about my daddy, one about her, 
and one about my sister and I growing up. Oh, I love that. So, you know, she has seven books to go through about, you know, who she was. You, and, you have seven books? Yeah, seven books for her. At seven books. You know, I like doing stuff. You know what I mean? And these beautiful pictures <laughs> like this back then. Well, you know, we took pictures with those uh, on, um, with those clicky cameras. Oh, yeah, and the, and, the, and the film on them is so, the, the quality is so good. I'm like, how you get this? Yeah, you know, those, those actually off of the film that they made, they're so good, because these are from the 60s. This is That's what I'm men with little girls. Yeah, we had those cameras back then. Wow. Back in the day, as me, her. So y'all always documented y'all lives. Y'all no, just me. Pictures? Just you. Just me. You the one that was taking pictures. It was my, no, I wasn't taking pictures. I always felt that lives should be documented. I didn't take no pictures, but I took other people's pictures and I <laughs> put them in books. Well, I say people gonna appreciate that. Because <laughs> I'm telling you, those are beautiful pictures. It's like, was your mom able to see that book? You did seven of them. I did seven of them. The Christmas day, she couldn't look at them. She said, I can't. And then she called me like a month later. She said, I read them. Why do you think she couldn't look at it? It was just too, you know, dad was gone by then. And, you know, it was just, she was getting older. And it's just hard to look at some things sometimes. I don't know. She, that's what she said. She just, she was just moved by it. 33 years. Mm. What is the one of the greatest lessons that you learned about marriage? And I'm gonna ask you what you learned about marriage and then what you learned about you being married for 33 years. You never get to stop talking about it. That's the one thing that I really, really learned. It's not, you never resolve. I mean, you resolve issues right. and things, but you, you always, and you always have to continue to talk and all the other issues will, will live and die on your ability to have a, a conversation about it. And, and so I think the ability to have a good conversation is, you know, everything. The ability to have a good conversation. Yeah, you know, and I, I, I realized when my, I, he was sitting there in that chair and I was sitting over here and we had an almost argument. Almost argument. And he was, said he was getting ready to do something. And I said, I don't like it when you do that. And he said, I know. But what I think you don't understand about that is this. And I thought about it. So you're saying this is why and this is what. Yeah. He said, yes. And I said, well, if, I, if you could do it this way, it'll help me. And he thought about it. I can do that. Oh, I love that. I love it. And we went and got dinner. I love it. I can do that. What you never understood, instead of me, why are you doing yeah. this again? What are you, don't you see that? Yeah. Didn't do that. I said, I don't like it when you do this because of that. That's good. This is what you do not, you know. Healthy communication. Mm -hmm. Why is that so hard? I do not know. It took us 30 years to figure that out. <laughs> but, it, but it is because people don't understand their own emotionality. Yeah. You know, people think because they feel strongly about something, it's, it, it's indicative of how right they are, and it's not. It's just indicative of how they feel, and they don't know why they feel yeah. that way. They don't know if it's something that their parents planned it, or you know, if you're having a bad day because people don't pay attention to how they feel. Yeah. I pay attention to how I feel all yeah. day long. Me too. How do I feel? If you're going to have a conversation or argument with someone, ask yourself, how do you feel? Because yeah. in your in a in a fight with anybody, the first battle is always with yourself. Mm. Because if you have an issue, you and I have an issue, if you upset me, I can't think. Mm -hmm. I don't have access to facts. I don't have the time and attention to listen to what you're saying to see the parts of what you're doing that I can say okay to. Yeah. 
I'm looking to defend my position. Yeah. But if I'm emotionally aware, I don't like his position. And this is the reason why I don't like it. That's good. I can talk to him about that. Not, why would you do that? I don't want to do that. My concern is when you do that, yes. how will that? So deal with your emotions first, send them down somewhere and then go, you know, don't convey your frustration, convey information. But most people can convey frustration. Don't convey your frustration, convey information. Yeah, and most people don't do that. They're just upset and they're telling people that they're upset. But when I get upset with you, I already know what I want you to do and a way to get you to do it. But the first thing I have to do is give you something you want. And so what, before I have a conversation with you, I find that, figure out how I'll give you something you want so you can give me what I want. Because it's not a zero-sum game. Yeah. I can get what I, if I can get what I need by giving you what you need. Yes. We've both won. Now, if I've gotten what you need, what I needed by pissing you off. Yeah. We've both lost. Yeah. I've had a temporary win, but I've lost you as a potential friend, a potential business partner, a yeah. potential, you know what I mean? Yeah. Good word. You know. That is so good. That is so applicable in everything. And it's so unfortunate that most relationships and especially marriages fail because of that thing. Right that now. thing. Just that. That thing. So all those years on divorce court, what did that do to you from a, a, an emotional standpoint? You're watching people's marriages. Uh, you're watching the demise of people's marriages. Did It saved mine. Why? And how. Remember that time I told you I called my mama, said, yeah. what do I do? I didn't know what was wrong mm. until I kept coming to court. Mm. And I kept seeing the women say the same thing. And I was like, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> that's what I'm doing. That's what's going on in my house. I'm, I don't like, I didn't know what was wrong. And, and so I finally figured out what was wrong. And then I could tell her and she fixed it for me. And then I took whatever she told me and I taught it from the bench. You know, dark seekers, all those things I did, that's from me learning from mom. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, she was a bad chick. Oh! You should have brought her in as a, as a judge one day. I know, I should have. She came out one time while, while I was there sitting in the back, you know, she just, just, just loving it. Just what did she think about the TV daughter? Hated it. Really? Why? It. Oh, she, why would you do that? It's so tacky. And <laughs> I wanted you to be on the, the first, you know, she wanted me to the have can, yeah, mm, yeah. can job is a job and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> But uh, she said that's yeah, yeah mm, she met, and I was so scared. I was so it was so silly. I um, when I got the job on divorce court, I, I had gotten another job before power of attorney it didn't last very long. Then I was home for five years. Then I got divorce court and I told my sister and I said, but don't tell mommy. <laughs> and so I went out to L.A. and my mom called home and the boys couldn't find me. And it was <laughs> it was no there were no cell phones. You try to hide. And uh, and uh I got scared. I, call, I had to call my sister. I said, could you tell mommy I've got a TV show? <laughs> Grown self, scared of your mom. <laughs> 47 years old. And, and my sister called and tell her I took a new job. And what she say? Attack. And she said, you know, you do what you want to do. Did, so answer this. Did that have any influence, even though you still decided to do what you wanted to do? To know that she didn't have your support, that they have any influence? Oh, I had her support. I she just you see, yeah. just like I, you know, she didn't want me to marry Eric, but I had her support. <laughs> she didn't want me to do this, but I had her support. Once I pick it, she wants to help me with it. She never wants me to fail. So <sighs> So at what point did you start seeing her heart turn towards Eric and your father where they say you picked a good man? Oh, the day I said I do. Really? Yeah, they just it was dumb to object after that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So they sent us a washer dryer <laughs> and a down payment on the house. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's yeah. support. That, that's support. That's right support. <laughs> yeah. Down payment. Daddy said you can either have a wedding or a down payment. I said, I want a down payment. Yeah. And then after that, they didn't say anything because I was married and they wanted me to be happy. See, I like that. That's maturity. Yeah. It's cause you, but, but like you've seen the opposite. People don't do it. Yeah. But people just get in your way. You did something I didn't like and I'm not going to get in. You deserve negativity on your whole marriage through, through I mean, it, until you get divorced. It just, I told you she's in the marriage first, but I Got nothing to do with you. Yeah. Got nothing to do with you. <laughs> and you all upset about it. And anytime you have any problems, you calling them for advice. Well, I told you. I told you that, man. Mm -hmm. You're like, well, I, I made the decision. Can you help me right. make it work? Now, now, because you wasn't supposed to do it in the first place. Right, yeah. God can't bless me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, My parents were not like that. Whatever trail you pick, we're going to help you travel. And you married a husband just like that. Yeah. And your husband was the type that he's going to help you blaze that trail. Not help me. He going to push you. Make me. <laughs> Oh, I mean, we fought like cats and dogs over that judicial campaign. Well, was... Why'd you say it almost led to divorce? Is that exaggerated? Because I'm shy. The, although people don't believe that, but I am. The idea of going door to door when I was 34 years, 33 years old, knocking on doors saying, hi, my name's Lynn Tola, vote for me, judge was, I was apoplectic at the entire notion that I was going to have to do that. I want y'all to look up that word. She said apoplectic. <laughs> I don't even know what that word is. I want y'all to go Google that word right now. <laughs> Apoplectic. Okay. Never heard that in my, in my life. But I, what I had was like a 10-month-old baby. Oh, okay. And I put him in the cart, and that was a good intro. <laughs> but by the time the campaign was over, every time he saw that carriage, she would start screaming. Because I'd go out all night <laughs> pressing them around. The baby starts screaming. Uh, he was traumatized. Say, yeah, he was traumatized. Because <laughs> I would work all day at the law firm. Come home, knock on pick doors. up the baby, go knock on doors, come home, cook dinner, you know. Yeah. And do your wifely duties. Right, Mostly, right. Wake up, go to work and do it all over I'll again. Do it all over again. All over again. When you look back, did you feel like you didn't have a, a, a chance at winning, even though you were doing? I didn't think so. He did. He believed in me. I didn't. He had, I remember we had a conversation once. I had a. One of the guys that I was running against was named Russ Barron. I liked him a lot. And he had been a lawyer in that community 12 years longer than I had so been alive. You to go to your opponent, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, he had been in that community. And there were several people in the race. And I had said to Eric, I said, you know, if I don't win, I hope Russ Barron wins. Yeah. And he turned around to me. And he says, I ain't never in my life gotten into a a uh what is it a race a race to come in second and if that's what you're looking to do you need a new campaign manager that's why i wasn't looking to come in second i was just saying so 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 if so. i didn't win but did the eric make himself your campaign he, oh no he was oh yeah <laughs> you did you did he made all the you didn't choose him to be your campaign he chose manager. him <laughs> he said i'm your campaign manager this is what we're i going wouldn't to. have done i wasn't gonna do it he said, come on, do it. I'll be your campaign man. You know, he, yeah. I was like. <sighs> so every great thing that you accomplished, he was the wind beneath your wings. Absolutely. No doubt about it. I mean, but for him, nobody would know who I was unless you lived in Cleveland. And but for him. But for I call him my but for brother. <laughs> but for him, none of this would have happened. And so when you look back over his life and you look at this moment that as you're transitioning his clothes out of his closet and you're still living in the home that y'all lived in for how many years? We moved here in 2014, so okay. it hasn't been that long. Yeah. Does that, how, does, how does that feel? Have you had questions about, well, maybe I should move or, or do you say, no, I want to sit in this? Well, I was counseled not to make any big decisions for two years good so that's good i just didn't now nah, i did i did build backyard build the backyard porch <laughs> i did do that and got a dog but um he liked the backyard and he was crazy about the lawn so i think he would approve of that and uh but i'm not going to make any decisions for another year that's good just that's good just sit here
Is that hard? Straight. Or you're the type that try to make decisions and... Well, I'll tell you what happened. When he died, the next week, we had new hardwood floors going in all the bedrooms. And I had to empty out his office mm. the week he died. Mm-mm. And he was an accountant. He had papers everywhere. I had to send stuff back to his clients. So... Mm. I was so busy putting out fires and then we had bought new doors and they came and it was just moving furniture and I didn't know why he was dead. I didn't know why he was dead for 90 days. And, and it was just, it was just, it was, it was lights and sirens all day long. So there was no sense of sadness. There was just extraordinary horror. Mm. You know, it was just horrifying. Unpack that for those that don't know. You said you didn't know why he was dead for 90 days. He went into the hospital for a minor test and died. And they called and said, we've never seen that happen before. And they took him from one hospital to another hospital, which I do not understand. And that hospital says they don't know why he's dead. And then they sent him for an autopsy and it took 90 days to get it. 90 days. Yeah. Is that unreasonable? I don't know how autopsies work. but It used to see. be, pre-COVID, it used to be a week. Yeah, because I'm like, where did 90 days from? Yeah, and, and think, I think they just got, oh, now, well, now we can wait 90 days. And, you know, That's and like, I called a couple times. Could you just, uh, nope, 90 days. So that's a lot of trauma to be going through. For yeah, a long period. it's a long, it's a long time. You know, they give you the case number and you look it up every day. Still says pending, pending. You field in phone calls. I'm trying to get trauma. Your trauma. You know, his phone, people, people were calling him. I'm sorry he's dead. His clients. I'm sorry he's dead. Uh, you would answer those calls. Got to. Phone ringing off the hook. It was the end of the year. It's tax time. Oh, mm. My taxes. I didn't know where anything was. It was like the center tent pole and somebody just pulled it. And what just hit me just now is two days later would be Christmas. And, the ne- and seven days after that is birthday. January 1, his birthday. That's a lot to go through, Judge Lynn. Oh, I wasn't. I was in the closet every evening. Just screaming. Just screaming. How did your kids wrap around you in that moment? Yeah, it was tough. Uh, There's a lot of long nights, a lot of drinking. Yeah. Um, it was difficult for them to hear me cry. Yeah. I have another house up the road and they used to go to that one, which was fine. But I tell you. Well, you're just being here wailing. Huh? You're just being Wailing. Here. Yeah. This, and they, and they couldn't take, but I tell you what they did do. You know, when we, we had to go up there Sam, my youngest son drove, um, they got me home. They went up to the hospital the next day. They went from parking lot to parking lot and found his car. Uh, you know, they just, as I fell apart, they just got started stepping up, you know, what you need, mom, what you need, mom, what you need, mom. And I, you know, or just go to bed, mom, go to bed. So they were just, uh, it was extraordinary. It was hard. It was terrible. But they, they really showed up. They really showed up. Again, I thank you. Um, this conversation is very healing for me. I always say on my podcast, journey with me as I discover, uncover, and recover love. 
And in this process, in this journey is to have these uncomfortable conversations, to see what it looks like on the other side of grief, to see what it looks like when someone loses the love of their life, how they function. Because oftentimes, like uh, one of my favorite movies being The Notebook, that oh was, yeah! Oh, I uh -huh. love it. Oh, I uh -huh. love it. That was, that was become, a good book. Yeah, you, you become so tethered to the person that when they pass away, the other person, the other person passes away shortly after due to grief, right. or mm -hmm. they say you die from a broken my heart. heart right, whatnot. right. Um, but I love that you love him. Mm. I love that this is what it looks like to care. Oh, this is what it looks like to care for a woman's heart properly. This is what it looks like to make your impact on your wife's heart to the point that you're not so you're not just celebrated because you're gone. Because what happens is I've seen it, Judge Lynn, when people pass away, you'll be at the funeral. They'd be like, I'm glad that low down. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> you'd be like, whoa, know, hope you don't yeah. say that about me. Yeah, right. Right. They'd be like, right. he was a little cheating dog. He was you like, wow. It yeah, was like it, they got rid of their worst problem right, when the person right, passed yeah. away. But to hear you be vulnerable and grieve out loud, a person that's respected, that's admired, that's adored by millions of people. And you say, hey, listen, this is how I am. I come on this live. I ain't going to have my makeup all done and <laughs> hair all done. This is me. Y'all going to get y'all gonna get what, what it is. is. But you don't realize how healing that is for the world. Because, well, I hope so. Because most people only want to show the highlights. Yeah. And you're showing the, the lowlights. Very <laughs> <laughs> low. Yes. The lowlights. The low and so I appreciate you. And I know oh. the world appreciates that and celebrates you for that. Um, yeah, I just honor you. Oh, I just, thank I just you. honor thank you, you so for much. going through this process. I honor you for finding value even in my podcast to have a sit down conversation with me. Oh no, I was excited to have you. When you said that last week, I said, uh, I called our studio. No, said, you were I was, on it. I, I was said, like, well, are you coming? He said, well, yeah, I'm on my flight. What are you talking I'm about? Like, don't, you talk, don't you back out with me now? I'm like, I'm at the airport. I'm about to knock on your door. What you talking about? I said, I don't care. I am coming because that's how much I admire you. Oh, that's how much I celebrate you. That's how much I respect you. Uh, you're you're a force, and, and I thank you. Um, you and I had a conversation. We'll just say this now. You were talking about wanting to do a podcast. Here's the thing. Everybody says you should do a podcast. Yeah. You should do a radio show, or you should do a YouTube channel. And I start messing with it, but I can't. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. We done came in your house and turned your whole little Turn my whole house upside down. And turned it to a whole little studio. A whole nother perspective. <laughs> so I'm going to be picking this brother's brain about yes. what's next. Yeah, we're going we gonna, to we gonna help you get your stuff because I know people would love to see you. As a matter of fact, I want y'all to leave a comment. What would y'all want Judge Lynn Toller to talk about on her podcast? Good what would idea. Yeah, what? Go ahead, drop yeah, it in the comments. Me. Tell us, what tell us. What y'all want from her? What do y'all want? <laughs> Because, uh, yeah, she said that she's at the phase of her life right now. She's going to do what she want to do. And only do oh what you want to do. Oh, my goodness, yes. Just, yeah. just, I'm all right. You know, podcast, my, 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 uh, my screenplay. I'm just going to do what I want to do. screenplay? Well, no, the one that, oh, I mean, yeah. just the uh, yeah. Judge Me Not. Yeah. The, uh, listen, I want y'all to go listen. Lit fam, y'all know how y'all are. Y'all are real big supporters of, of writers and, and published authors. I want y'all to blow Judge Lynn's mind. I want y'all to go get this book right here. I want y'all to go get this book, My Mother's Rules. This right here is Dear Sonali. Yep. Letters to, to the, the daughter, daughter I, I never, never had. had. What is this about? I had six sons. I always wanted, my mother and I had such a tremendous relationship, and I always wanted to replicate that. And, you know, nothing but boys. And so I have a lot of young ladies that have always uh, talked to me and everything. And this one young lady in Brooklyn, I had given a speech and she came up to me afterwards and she said, because you said, you told one lady he's keeping you pregnant so he can keep you down. I realized that's what was happening to me and I got out of an abusive relationship because of you and I wanted to say thank you. And I said, wow. You said that on your show? 
No, she, we, we were in Brooklyn, New York. I'm talking, where'd you say that? You I sent that on the show somewhere. Yeah. I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> she that. did. And she said, I listened to it. And uh, I got out of an abusive relationship. She just, it struck me. And I thought, huh, if one thing I said did that for her, what right do I have not to write down what I know? So I did. Yeah, Sonata, where that name come from? Sonata is my best is my best girlfriend in Cleveland. So you named the book after her? After her. So, cause I cause if I ever had a daughter, I was gonna name her Sonali after her. Love and it. And so since I didn't have a daughter, I named the book after her. So I want them to go get this book. This is the book you self-published, right? Yes. Uh, Dear Sonali is the one Dear I self-published. I think women really will gravitate towards that. Letters to the daughter I never had. So for that age group, what do you think that, that book speaks to? What 20, age? Twenty, thirty. I've had some 40-year-olds saying, I don't know what you're talking about. I, you know, but I'm gonna get I, 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 gotta get, I got something out of it myself, but it's about life and love and perspective. It's funny. It's, you know, rules to live by. It's all the stupid stuff I did. My mother's rules. We already know what that book is about. Yeah, that's That book mama. is a book full of gems of uh, the gems that your mother deposited and to old Judge Lynn. Yes, yeah, she did. Yeah, that's what that is. And then this book right here. Making, Making Marriage work. work. That's right. I wrote it while Eric and I were working through the ugly part. The ugly part. Yep. Making Marriage Work. And what's the takeaway from this book? I teach, I teach women how to talk men and men how to talk women. I talk about, uh, you know, what kind of conversations to have and what's in a good conversation. You know, I talk about that conversation, you know, about how to talk to people and, and, and what you do with this issue and that issue because you run into everything. Yeah. So it's a journey. This is yeah. what I want y'all to do. And I'm going to do it as well. Don't pick a book to buy. Buy all three of them. <laughs> Just buy all three of them. Oh, you can gift it to people. I am going to go buy all three of them. Go buy all three of these books. Just blow her mind. I just want to celebrate this queen um, and also leave a comment on what she should talk about on her podcast. Like what subject matter? Do you want to talk about the legal stuff or does she want to talk about like, what is it? What is it? I got my thoughts and uh, what, what, what it should be about after this interview. We started talking about this at first and I was like, ah, she's such a wealth of information. What angle should she take? But I realized uh, I got some ideas. And so I want to hear what y'all's ideas are about the amazing Judge Lynn Toler and what she should speak about. I would be remiss if I don't ask you this, and I only want to be insensitive mm -hmm. about this, but do you think you'll ever remarry? Can't say it. My mother never did. His, my husband's father's wife died first, and he never, his father never remarried. Mm. And my mother, she lived 25 years. 25 years? After he died, never remarried. I can't say it. Yeah. See, I always wonder about that impact that someone makes in your life. Like you see the Coretta Scott Kings. And you're yeah. like, we, like, who do you marry after you? And marriage is a lot of compromise. Yeah. It's a lot of not getting what you want. And at 64, I'm not willing to do that <laughs> for anybody else. You know what I mean? I loved him. Yeah, you no, know I mean, I loved him. And we, we spent a lot of years together. And all the compromises I made for him I'm totally happy and comfortable with, yeah. and I was going to continue to make any compromises I needed to make in order to stay married. But I ain't got him no more. So you about so what you saying, Judge Lynn? You setting your ways? Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> I got you looking like you just thinking about the whole journey that made you evolve to become this in marriage. Being it's a, a lot of yeah, work being with lot. somebody. Yeah, it really, really is, and I, you know, I'm not. I can't see somebody coming in here and I'm going to stop doing something I've been doing because they don't and, like And it. something that worked with the last one. Wait, and then you're no. like, I, I took a lot of work becoming this. Now you want to up. What, what do we mean? You wanna, I had this argument already. We don't already had this fight. I won it. I'm not having it with you. <laughs> I'm not doing it. I'm going to have friends. I'm going to have. And I got six sons. I've always got a date. Yeah, you sure do. I've sons. always got a date. So. <laughs> He's already won this argument. Mm -hmm. this. I'm not having it with somebody else. <laughs> Judge Lynn, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Anything you would like to say to the viewers? 
How y'all do? <laughs> Thank you for your support during this difficult time. Yeah. And I love y'all. Good, man. Thank you so much for taking time. Hey, y'all give it up for my homie, Judge Lynn Toller, y'all. Ladarian thrusted suddenly into Child Protective Services in 2015. My nephew, black, a boy. The likelihood of being adopted outside of kinship, slim to none. Armani, 16 years old, black, a boy, with five years in the foster care system before I even knew his name. The likelihood of ever being adopted, yep, you guessed it, slim to none. While Ladarian and Armani were trying to survive and barely thrive in an overpopulated and underfunded foster care system, I was living my own life, doing well professionally. Having been a single father with a daughter who at that point was doing well in college, it was my time to live my life, right? Wrong. I felt unsettled, tireless, agitated. There are just too many of our black children stuck in ambiguity and in the limbo of the foster care system. In 2017, I legally adopted my nephew, Ladarian. Fast forward to 2019, I had no ties to this other young king, but I felt God instructed me to adopt him also, and I obeyed. Starting over with parenting should have been enough, right? Working with various foster care and adoption agencies to help bring awareness to the countless young black kings in the foster care system should have decreased my agitation, right? Joining the board of directors of Advantage Adoption, an organization that helps find permanent adoptive homes for children in foster care, should have led to some type of resolve, right? No, not at all. None of it felt like I had done enough. I now realize that every one of those experiences was laying the fundamental foundation for my life's mission, Kingdom Royale. Kingdom Royale will be a luxury, state-of-the-art home for foster boys. Our first location will be in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. We will utilize the whole person approach that instills identity, empowers them to advocate for themselves, and enlightens them regarding new perspectives and limitless options that they thought were impossible. Though the young kings will attend the local public schools that are in proximity to Kingdom Royale, our at-home curriculum will broaden their worldview through participating in the arts, attending various cultural events, learning about and engaging in multifaceted discussions about current events and even relevant historical contexts, introducing them to gardening and landscaping and even caring for our animals on our farm and on-site stables. We just launched our startup capital campaign with the goal of raising $2.8 million. Now, why $2.8 million? Well, in 2017, I created a web series in which I performed random acts of kindness for targeting the homeless community. One of the most notable successes was that one of the videos went viral, garnering 28 million views. However, one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't raise a single dollar to help in implementing a more sustainable plan for the homeless community. So throughout the years, with much remorse, I reflected on not maximizing that moment. I knew if at that time, just 10% of the viewers donated $1, we would have raised at least $2.8 million that could have really established long-term support for the homeless community, or at least started a long-term initiative to do so. This is my do-over. This is our new beginning. Together, we can attack this at the root by specifically helping our homeless black boys who are already disproportionately represented in the American foster care system. I'm LaTeris R. Whitfield. I've been nominated for three regional Emmys documenting my work with the homeless as well as my personal adoption journey. Despite those accolades, the greatest award for me is truly providing the infrastructure for a transformed life. Visit KingdomRoyale.com for more details. Crown a king and make a donation today. Man, it's been a long time coming to interview Judge Lynn Toller. Judge Lynn, thank you so much. Again, thank you. I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your life, taking time in this sensitive season of your life to just have a conversation with me, a conversation that will last a lifetime. You deposited gems into my mind, into my heart, into my soul that... 
my future wife is going to benefit greatly from. Well, here's my favorite part of the podcast where I speak to my future wifey. Dear future wifey, as I pin down these words, I'm reminded of the preciousness of life and the importance of making each day count. Life is a fleeting journey and none of us are promised tomorrow. In light of this, I look forward to embracing every moment with you. Time is a gift and I want to spend it building a life filled with meaningful experiences alongside you. In the uncertainties of life, my commitment to you is to make every day special. May we savor each sunrise and sunset, find joy in the mundane, and hold on to each other in times of joy and sorrow. Let's not postpone the expressions of love and appreciation, knowing that life is a delicate balance that deserves our utmost attention. Let's make each day count, knowing that our time together is a precious gift not to be taken for granted. Your future hubby. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Dear Future Wifey podcast. Remember, be lit, live intentionally and transparently, and don't stop loving. Make sure to subscribe to our Dear Future Wifey YouTube channel. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. We welcome your support. Simply share our podcast with your friends and family. 